For Colby College, this would be a memorable afternoon. The Alumni Club of Boston had organized a unique moment in Colby's history. Before an audience of more than 400, including alumni from 55 Colby classes, the college's three consecutive living presidents had come to share their perspective on liberal arts education and their experience as Colby presidents. Library and chapel. The afternoon's host, room Robert Anthony, Colby 38, chairman of the Board of Trustees. Uh, and, and that, uh, 37 faculty members, 700 students. And the three whom the everyone had come to see and hear. J. Seeley Bixler, president from 1942 to 1960. Robert E. L. Strider, president from 1960 to 1979. And William R. Cotter, Colby's president today. And in the audience, Mary Bixler, Helen Strider, and Linda Cotter. Now, each of you came at different times, and I think it might be interesting to start with your impressions of what it was like when you got there. Well, it'll only take a minute and a half, but... <laughs> Uh, Frank Johnson, you remember, June 30th, 1931, persuaded the Board of Trustees to move the college if and when feasible. Depths of the Depression, just unimaginable. Now, I just speak of it because we must not, as Colby people, forget that. The first uh, plan had been to have Gothic buildings. Well, you know how they would have fought the landscape. And Gothic, after all, is the architecture of tension and struggle and stress. Pointing up, uh, the problem is solved above. It's not solved down here. It's the, <laughs> it's the, it's the architecture of reverence for that which is above. But here were these beautiful colonial Georgian buildings rising out of the ground, so out of the terrain so cleverly. The architect suggesting reason emerges from nature that way and controls nature as it comes. And of course, the suggestion was Greek. And I probably told many of you that one of, and on my first year there, a lady said, I can't stand having all these Greek temples going up on a main hillside. They just don't belong there. <laughs> and I had to tell her, they aren't temples. They're halls for rational discourse. There is a chapel, yes. And, the, and of course, the chapel is there on higher ground than the library, offering its intuitions to the library. But the library is the center and the focal point. And, its influence radiates out through the campus. The campus was a pasture in 1942, waiting to become the new college. And as the first symbols of that new campus took shape, those at the college, cramped by railroad tracks in Waterville, were anticipating the change. And as the physical change became tangible, the vision of a remarkable new college began to surround Seely Bixler. The excitement of that campus taking shape seemed to touch everyone. And as the 40s became the 50s, the move from downtown was a fact. The academic foundations and the physical presence of Colby College had been realized. And the college community that had been a vision was now a community of undeniable significance to the world beyond. And it seemed to me that the scientist in his Mayflower Hill laboratory must be confirmed by the work of the scientist in London and in Tokyo. It's society that approaches these problems. No one lives to himself alone. No country lives to itself alone. The individual student ought to have a like-minded, helpful community. These are terrifying days we live in. And I think any student must feel that at some time in his college course. And if he has a community supporting him, then he has a chance to deal with these things. Well, it took a long time to get the community into those buildings, but that's another story. Bob, when you came, the buildings were there. Some of them. But there, some of them were there. <laughs> at least the move had been made. What did you think when you arrived? Faculty was in the mood for some educational experimentation, that there was a kind of intellectual ferment going on. This was in 1957. But the first objective, it seemed to me, was to stimulate the academic program, to, to step up its voltage, uh, to develop the faculty further. 
It was a good faculty, it was a good program. Uh, Dr. Bixler had introduced art and music into the curriculum of this college, and they weren't there before. And this was a big step forward. It changed the nature of the college somewhat, I think. So we did go to Kobe, and I did find the faculty in the mood for some serious talk. And Bob Strider brought both new ideas and resolute leadership to Colby. And though much seemed the same, Colby students would be challenged as never before by an expanding range of rigorous courses and an innovative plan for independent study. The growing quality of the academic community was matched by an increasingly sophisticated physical plant. But the mid-60s and early 70s brought other challenges to Mayflower Hill, as the stresses of a nation were reflected on hundreds of campuses. Colby embraced that time and grew from it. And much to Bob Strider's credit, the institution his intellectual and practical leadership had so enhanced was becoming second to none. One of the challenges of those years was to extend these already wide dimensions to bring Colby more and more before the public. Bob Strider put into my hands a faculty that was, I think, without peer in liberal arts colleges in this country. The spirit on the campus was one of expectation, of devotion to Colby, of love for what it stood for all these times, and curiosity about what this New Yorker was going to bring when he came. Bill Cotter has brought a remarkable depth of intellectual and administrative capacity as Colby's 18th president. His commitment to Colby values, traditions, and standards of excellence is felt by everyone at the college. But liberal arts education has been under critical review, and the value of colleges like Colby is requiring articulate defense against critics concerned with the rush of advanced technology, job markets, and the continuing press of inflation. But the vitality of the Colby community inspires a confident optimism. Through innovation, flexibility, and disciplined leadership, the Colby educational experience will continue to equip its graduates for the creative embrace of a future of many directions. I think the challenge is maintenance of quality and the maintenance of that very special collegial atmosphere that has been developed over the years where students have access to faculty, where faculty have access to one another, and where students have access to one another. There is a tremendous inflation problem, which we all know, which has hit every sector of the economy and has hit liberal arts colleges, and the faculty of liberal arts colleges particularly uh, in a very devastating way. We must rebuild the real purchasing power of faculty salaries. We're worried about the trend toward vocationalism in the country. I think Colby properly stands against that trend because it's short-sighted, it will train people too narrowly, and it will not create the kinds of leaders that this country needs. And it is leadership creation that liberal arts colleges are particularly good at. Some people would say that the liberal arts education is irrelevant today. There's a report you may have heard of which says that we can't continue with the kind of education that we've had in the past, that we must make a drastic change in uh, uh, education at, in liberal arts colleges, a greater change than has occurred in the last hundred years. What's your comment on that? I think the Sloan report is very astute, and there's no question in my mind but that uh, Computer literacy, as Bill said, and technological literacy are sine qua nones for the graduate of a, of a first-rate college, as Colby is in the present day. And I think their emphasis on quantitative analysis and the ability of students to think quantitatively is very well put, and it's a, it's a persuasive document from what I've seen of it. On the other hand, as you can well imagine, I have a I have a reservation about it that arises from, from this consideration. I don't think we're really talking about the nature of the liberal arts as such. I don't think the liberal arts themselves will change. I think we're talking about the avenues toward a fuller understanding of man's role in the, in the universe and on this earth. And we can understand it better, I think, by having a command 
of the tools that are available to us to make that understanding clearer. I think the Sloan Foundation may make a natural error, which is that the liberal arts is somehow seen as disconnected from the real world. At Colby, computer sciences are not going to be taught primarily in a section called computer sciences. Most of the computer science will be taught in economics, in other social sciences, in the natural sciences, and there are even faculty in the humanities who see applications of computer sciences to their own research, to their own teaching. And we will begin to show how the technological revolution of today is applicable and usable and teachable within the traditional liberal arts context. There is nothing static about the liberal arts, and it is broad enough to include all the new technology. We're not afraid of it. We're very comfortable with it. We've had it a very long time, and they ought to learn that. I think Bill has said it extremely well. We often talked about the liberal arts as the liberating arts. What do they liberate? They liberate the human intelligence and the human imagination to go beyond the confines of the day-to-day -day and to see around the corners and to see into the horizons. And I think that's what the Colby curriculum is designed to do. Well, the new electron microscopes, by the way, are one of the most exciting things that's happened, I think, in the sciences at, at Colby. This is, a, again, a tool, a very imaginative tool that raises the dimension of human consciousness in a very dramatic fashion. Uh, through the sciences, through the social sciences, through the humanities. Students glimpse these further vistas, what Wordsworth called the light that never was on sea or land. And we can't lose sight of that. What we mean by the distinction between liberal and vocational is not that the humanities are liberal and that business methods are vocational. We mean that one is taught with an eye to the larger pattern and to the interconnections between the essential facts and essential ideas. That's what liberalism is. John Kemeny said after the Three Mile Island accident, President of Dartmouth, who was head of that commission to investigate it, a liberal arts graduate ought to be somebody who can go into a problem and know nothing about it, and within six months be a master of the problem and understand the possible solutions, both technologically and in terms of their environmental and social impact. In a very short span of time, a large proportion of the total working force will be engaged in professions that have not yet even been thought of. Uh, and how are we going to, to educate students for professions that haven't even been thought of? The way we're going to do it is just the way you had said, to uh, discipline their minds, to uh, help them learn to adapt themselves to uh, a changing world, so that when the thing that they have learned is obsolete, they have disciplined and well-furnished minds ready to attack a whole new problem. You may remember that one of the things that I often said to the freshmen when they arrived in the fall, many of you, I understand, have come to college with the intention of finding yourselves. Our mission as a college is to show you that there are more interesting things to find. <laughs> I'm not sure the freshmen always liked it. The parents loved it. <laughs> Would you want to make some comments about what you think the role of a college president should be? There's so many different kinds of jobs that college presidents do. Um, and, and I think the public may think, well, I mean, he's a fundraiser, or he's a <coughs> babysitter, or he's a public relations expert. Well, you have to be a lot of interesting things. You do have to raise funds, obviously. You do have to have some talent for balancing budgets, or at least getting people on the staff who know how to do it. The primary mission of the college is an intellectual mission, and it's the president's job, I think, to keep reminding everybody of that and by some sort of example, demonstrating that his or her commitment to the mind is the preeminent thing too. I lived and worked under two very able college presidents, Alexander Michaeljohn at Amherst and William A. Nielsen at Smith. And one thing that I learned from both of them was that the college president's job, among, of course, other interests, must keep central before the faculty and before the students the notion that the purpose of the college is intellectual. Now you say, well, that's obvious. It isn't obvious at all to a great many people. But I think that if I had to describe the most important function of a college president, it's to support the faculty. The real learning goes on in the classroom, and we've got to give the resources 
to see to it that the curriculum has grown organically uh, as faculty interests and the direction has changed. Um, this does not mean that we are a passive presider at, uh, at faculty meetings, uh, but it does mean that the uh, recognition that the role of the college president is, is in, in the large part supportive uh, rather than directive. You're all saying one thing, and that is that you are sharply disagreeing with the report that we are going to see the greatest change in liberal arts colleges that we have seen in the past 100 years. Uh, Bill, would you like to say what you think will happen to Colby in the decade or so ahead? Celie Bixler's reputation for knowing the name of every student uh, on the campus during his entire presidency and I think he's picked up some of our students since then, Bob, <laughs> is legion. And that's a terribly important part of Colby College. One of the things that I think challenges me and our administration and the faculty is to maximize that small college advantage. We hope that we as a, as a college and you as the alumni of this college can help spread the word about what is special about a liberal arts college. The real work of the college goes on between the faculty and the students. It's where personal growth comes alive. It's the support of that faculty and their dedication way beyond any job description. I think it is not only the friendly atmosphere at Colby which distinguishes us, but it's a willingness of our faculty to spend inordinate numbers of extra hours caring about students. The college president has to realize that we are asking our faculty to teach a very heavy course load. We are asking them to be career counselors. We are now asking them to increasingly be scholars and to publish the results of their scholarship. We must give them the time and the resources to enable them to do that. So those, when I say support the faculty, those are some examples of the things that I think we must do uh, in the next 20 years at Colgate. It had been a warmly memorable and thought-provoking afternoon for everyone. And for those who listened and watched, whether from the class of 1916 or 1985, each would be reminded that what Colby College had become and what it would be in the future was the contribution of many and the leadership of these three men.